All right. Well, let's see. I, I didn't have time to write um, a, a talk today, and so I'm just going to copy one of the speeches from yesterday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nobody watched MSNBC last night. <laughs> All right. Never. <laughs> never mind. Okay. So, uh, so there are a lot of people who have been working on this issue of whether or not we can do better with radial velocity precision. And so I've listed the names of many of them here. I, I really can't stick this on me. I don't know. Um, but uh, Jesse Sajewski and Alan Davis, my uh, graduate student who's here, uh, and Eric Ford and Xavier de Musk uh, have been meeting weekly uh, for the, uh, the last year trying to sort of sort this out. Can we do better? Um, to go from exoplanet radii, right, which you get with transit, um, to real characterization, uh, understanding bulk densities and whether or not there's a gaseous atmosphere, really requires masses, obviously, right? Masses give the densities for transiting planets uh, and uh, help us to interpret exoplanet atmospheres once we get spectra. All right, so I think that if we don't succeed in improving our radial velocity precision, that right now we are in an exoplanet bubble, and that is bad news for all of you guys. It, the bubble may burst, right? I really think we, this is important enough that we have to push it along. And I come from a perspective of working for 20 years uh, on this problem now. And so here you see a summary of the planets uh, that have been detected, M Sinai and Jupiter, units of Jupiter masses, versus the publication uh, date uh, shown here. And uh, in 2010, my dear friend Greg Laughlin, who's a theorist, said, look, if we just extrapolate the bottom of this curve, then by 2015 we'll be finding Earth. But it doesn't work that way <clears throat> because every improvement over time uh, was hard earned. There were uh, improvements in the, um, in the instruments or in the cadence of observing you know, or something. And I would say that there's a little bit of concern here, right, that we really began to level out in the types of planets that we could detect in about 2010. So we haven't done much better over the last five years. And I think that coincides with the fact that there haven't been any big changes in the field, no big, enormous improvements uh, in the technology. Um, that's going to change very soon. All right, I'm going to try and use this. All right, the other uh, warning, uh, the canary in the coal mine, is this plot uh, that I first saw by Hanno Rain, right, where he does the same thing. He shows the planets that have been detected um, as a function of the discovery year, and now he color codes them according to the types of techniques that have found the planets. And so the radial velocity technique, which I use, um, you know, sort of peaked again in about 2010, and it's kind of been falling off. We haven't been finding that many more planets. Lots of transits discovered with Kepler, um, but I think you know if we were to roll forward, imagine that we're giving this talk and it's three years from now, um, and TESS hasn't launched yet. Are we going to see, you know, what, what kind of a peak are we going to see? So um, again, I think there's a slight issue. And the question is, <clears throat> what technique is going to be used to find analogs of our Earth? Can any of you tell me? What are we going to use? Are we going to use transits? What? Yes. Would be able to do that. <laughs> okay. Xavier and I are on the same track, right? <clears throat> um, if we can't improve our precision, uh, is this technique all washed up, essentially? You know, would you want to go into this field of measuring, taking Doppler measurements? Um, radio velocities will always provide some kind of support, right, for big planets. But if we don't improve our precision, then we've got a slight problem. We can look at this still another way, right? Which shows the mass of the planets and the orbital periods that have been detected here. And we see that over all the years you know, that we've been working now, we've got this little corner of the plot which is just is not uh, populated. And if you think that finding Earth-like planets is important for finding life, right, the thing that we are no less is our goal, um, then in this overlapping Venn diagram of, of the mass of the planet and distance, Right, it's a cartoonish diagram, uh, so I'll make apologies for that. But where you might have a rocky planet with liquid water on the surface, then we don't really have any planets that fall inside of that box. We can throw in the Kepler detections, right? And, and there's a few uh, candidates, uh, but we don't have masses for those candidates. So because of the, of the second loss of the second reaction wheel on Kepler, <clears throat> K 
Kepler was repurposed, and we've lost the continuous coverage of this field that we would have needed to roll this population uh, out to longer orbital periods. Um, Tess isn't going to, there's a poster that's out uh, talking, discussing this from one of the grad students from MIT. Tess isn't going to come into you know, this region. I don't think that Cheops is to any great extent. I don't think that Plato is. I don't think that you know, Gaia is. So I think we're facing a future where we say we want to find life on other planets, um, but we don't really have the tools to be able to do that. Uh, so is there a technique on the horizon to really detect Earth analogs? I'm going to argue that it's the radial velocity technique. So uh, we have this long history, right, about trying to understand what the floor of the Doppler precision is. And in this paper, nice paper by uh, Butler et al., um, there's a, I pulled a quote that ultimately the limit to velocity precision is set by the stars themselves. On long time scales, stellar magnetic cycles, uh, analogous to the solar cycle, could insidiously cause apparent periodic changes in the radial velocity. So that is definitely true, right? That is a truth. Uh, the floor of the radial velocity precision, uh, as an observer, as a postdoc uh, in the 90s, right, um, uh, the floor of the radial velocity precision was 3 to 5 meters per second. That's what, you know, that was what our precision happened to be. And then when the Geneva team came along and built HARPS and did better, uh, now the floor of the RV precision is one meter per second. But again, uh, that's sort of matched to uh, the measurement precision, right? So uh, are we really, have we really punched through the floor? Well, <clears throat> I think we are certainly at the level where we've controlled a lot of the error bars in this measurement technique. Um, and we're left with stellar jitter. Stellar jitter, I'm going to sweep, I'm going to let Xavier explain this in his talk uh, in more detail, but the things like pulsation of the star, uh, spots that rotate on the surface of the star, faculae uh, on the surface of the star, meridional flows, time varying magnetic fields which suppress granulation, right? All, all these things in and of themselves don't matter. If they vary in time, they matter a lot, right? <coughs> So, uh, re and also recall that, you know, when we, when we think of these, these are not simple cartoonish single spot, uh, spots on the surface of the star. Uh, we saw families of spots, sometimes on the ascending and sometimes also on the descending limb of the star. So I think it's not clear that we're ever going to be able to go from first principles and actually model uh, with some physical, you know, uh, insight all of these effects on the surface of the star. Uh, so I uh, think treating them as nuisance parameters is an interesting way to go. OK, we have to keep in mind this, though. That stellar jitter doesn't look like a Doppler shift. Yes, it's a problem right now. Let's try and understand why it's a problem. Stellar jitter doesn't have the same time coherence. Uh, it, it waxes and wanes on different time scales. And uh, the underlying phenomena of, from stellar jitter, whether it's spots or, or magnetic field changes, um, have information line by line in the spectral, okay? Signatures that should be distinguishable from orbital Doppler uh, velocity shifts. So, oh, I think I have to, I hope this works. Dude, is there a planet in my data? Okay, so Chaz, you see a planet here? It has an 11-day period, right? OK, so let's keep watching this star. This is a little window of, star that, uh, of data that I took on Epsilon Iridani from Chiron using Chiron. And that little window is uh, actually focused right here, OK, in time. But you can see that this is actually waxing, right? It's changing. The amplitude, the characteristic of these radial velocities is changing with time. Planets don't do that, OK? And so. In 2014, we took observations of Epsilon Eridani using the MOST satellite and uh, radial velocity measurements with Chiron in this time window. And we, um, you know, um, unfortunately it was a little less active here. The star was a little less active. But when we did, we saw that here's the MOST photometry on the star, and it has an 11-day period. Um, and this 11-day period from photometry syncs up very nicely with the radial velocity measurements that we have. So here's the most photometry, the variability in the star, 
the brightness of the star. And here's the radial velocity measurements that we got with uh, Chiron. And you can see that um, uh, this spot model, weird spot model with two spots, I'm not sure that it's 100% unique, but it is a solution that explains both of these data sets. So what we're seeing here is um, our spots on the surface of the star. Um, I do want to clarify, because I think that we have a responsibility to lead the young folks in this area, about the difference between plage and faculty, right? So this is something that's been a very blurry definition in our community. And it's only the heliophysicists that are really coming down hard on me. And I live with one in my, in my physics department. Um, so here, these are EIT images taken with SOHO. Uh, and, and it shows a uh, plage, these incredibly bright spots in the lower chromosphere, in the low density, lower chromosphere of the star. So plage, this is a transfer of magnetic energy, right? There's magnetic field lines that are going to tie the plage and the chromosphere to the faculty and the photosphere. Uh, but when you deliver energy into the chromosphere, you're exciting an atomic transition, right? Which results in emission. Uh, so here's the kind of thing that you see. Uh, this, is an H, this is the H alpha line, right? And these are data that were taken um, when we uh, from Chiron when we were looking with the most satellite. And what we saw was that the H alpha core emission was changing as the spots were rotating on the surface of the star. So the, this, the little green, is of course the difference between the a nominal, uh, one nominal observation of H alpha and the, a time series that go with it. So the plage causes emission in spectral line course. Okay, it doesn't cause so much a flux change, but it does operate, uh, it is connected with faculty. Uh, faculty are extend these extended regions on the surface of the star. And again, magnetic field lines are tying these two uh, phenomena together. And the magnetic field lines suppress the granulation. And when they suppre suppress the granulation, you get a change in the shape of the line profile. And that, any change, any change at all is tough. Um, because there's a magnetic field line, it's suppressing energy transfer, suppressing convection, right? That's why it's dark. Energy's not coming out anymore. But energy has to get out of the star. And so it's going to spill out in the regions uh, where there's plage. Okay, so there's these photospheric velocity flows, right? They're, um, they're caused by things like pulsation, changes in granulation, meridional flows, magnetic fields, which manifest as spots, plage, faculty. Um, and these introduce time-varying signals that cause a problem. And there are lots of studies, uh, like this one by Solanke and Unruh, on the spot number and the sizes on the star. Uh, and in general, these are stochastic. And a worry is that on the sun, you know, typically these are less than 0.1%, uh, often much less than 0.1%. Okay, so it's a tiny, a tiny effect. All right, so Chaz, dude, is there a planet in my data? That looks pretty darn good, right? There's data here. There's observations taken in between February and March, and then again in April and May. So you've got a couple of epochs that persist to show, you know, show the same signal. Uh, this is an optical high resolution. The, the velocities were derived from optical high resolution spectra, um, and the authors looked for line bisector variations and saw nothing. But some of you will recognize the publication. So first of all, it's in Nature magazine, so can it be right? Um, but uh, you know, w uh, the observations taken with the CryRes uh, are dramatically different. So here is the radial velocity signature um, that Sedawan et al. found in the um, with the optical spectra, and then here are the measurements in the infrared. Okay. So what's happening is that in the infrared. The contrast between the spots and the photosphere is much lower. And so since it's much lower, you, you just don't see the effect as strongly. So, um, so this has motivated a lot of people to think maybe we should look in the infrared. Um, yeah, maybe. OK. So uh, it's not a planet. It's just, it was just a star spot. right? So here's data that I took on one of my I used to call it my favorite stars. It actually feels like it's my nemesis now, Tau Ceti at Lick Observatory. Um, and then here's the data set that we got uh, with Chiron. So there's a kind of interesting story that I want to tell you about. 
Um, and that is that here, the data look pretty good, right? It's about, we have uh, individual error bars that are about, oops, a half a meter per second. And the RMS is about 1.3 meter per second. And people have analyzed the Tau SETI data, let's say from HARPS and other places, and they found, you know, evidence, statistical evidence for like up to, I don't know how many planets, five, six, I don't know, lots of planets. Okay, and so I noticed that with Chiron, I was seeing this um, periodic sort of signal. If you run these, these data through a periodogram, um, this is just one short season, right, but we have a few years of data then there's a really strong peak that comes up at 30 some days, 31, something like that. Right? That's what happens to be the rotation period of the star. And so then I talk to our friends at, uh, who work at HARPS right, and ask them, what do you guys see for Tau Ceti? I'll give you our data. I just want to know what's going on. And you know, they analyze their data, take a periodogram, and see nothing. So um, why is it that we're, we're seeing this si periodic signal associated with the spot noise, the spot, right, the spot rotation period of the star, and the HARPS team wasn't seeing us. You know, what, what's going on here? Okay, so, uh, so I went to Xavier and I said, can we, you know, would you mind, you know, he indulged me and he said, let's do a double blind study. Um, so Xavier started with the SOAP spectra, and I think you guys will be uh, working with this and if you're in this um, hands-on session. So uh, he generated simulated spectra, and I like that because it's a controlled situation. We know the answers in the back of the book, right? And he was able to, on the surface of the star, put in spots and faculae and also planets. Now, he starts with the NSO atlas, and so the resolution is about 500,000, and the signal to noise is at least 1,000, right? So it's incredibly... Uh, beautiful pristine data, but that's okay. Let's just start with something simple and keep going. And then I had my then postdoc, Ji Wang, uh, take the, the spectra that Xavier had created and change them into iodine spectra. So he multiplies the spectra by an FTS iodine. He convolves that product with the PSF. We don't even mess around. We d I decided, let's not try and solve for the PSF. Let's just, in, when I model the data, I'll just use the, real, the PSF that, he, that Ji Wang used. Okay, but the important thing is something that Chaz told me. Whenever you can zero out any of your error terms, you really want to do that, right? And so I like this experiment because it zeroes out any differences between HARPS and high res you know? It's, it's exactly the same data set. It's exactly the same signal to noise. It's exactly the same resolution. Everything is the same, but we're going to analyze it differently. Xavier with the cross-correlation function and me with the iodine uh, code that I have. Okay, so it's uh, Demusk versus Fisher here. Um, and, um, and what we see is, I've hidden some of the data from you. Um, I want you to, there's a lot of stuff going on in this plot and I didn't have time to regenerate it. So let's just look at the I2 radial velocities. That's the radial velocities that I derived with my Doppler code. And the CCF radial velocities in the, in the blue. These are the radial velocities that Xavier derived with his code. Okay, now I overplotted, so you can't actually tell, but the, uh, there's like perfect agreement uh, in this place where there was uh, one spot on the surface of the star and we looked at time series and sometimes that one spot is behind the star and so in those cases we both get radial velocities of zero. We both agree, right? So I, I, it didn't have to be that way, so, but it was, so that was a really good checkpoint, right? The, we both find that the RMS when the spot is behind the star is equal to zero. Um, okay, so now when the spot comes out in front of the stars, we, we get very different answers, right? So with the radial velocity technique, um, the, 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 sorry, the iodine technique shown here with the black line and the CCF shown with the blue line, there's a difference in the amplitude, right? So that's something that, you know, to try and understand. Um, there's no noise that's been added to these spectra. Uh, we know the PSF, as I said, we just hardwired it into the analysis. So Xavier put in a big spot, so there's nothing ambiguous about it, and yet we get different answers, right? The iodine radial velocity RMS is 37 meters per second, and the CCF radial velocities are 30 meters per second, right? So what's up with that? You know, why, why would there be a difference? Um, and as we thought about it, it comes down to a fundamental difference in the way that we're analyzing our data. You saw yesterday in Xavier's talk 
that the CCF uses these windows, right, uh, um, uh, sort of a mask for the CCF. And that mask has been carefully tuned, in some sense, probably to, uh, to minimize the impact of stellar noise. Whether it was intentional or not, I'm not sure. But the iodine code is not that clever. Uh, the iodine uh, code says, I, I have to model everything, all right? I have to model the continuum. I have to model the line shapes. I have to model everything. And I'm not letting the PSF change. And so that means that the iodine code is being tugged around more uh, by spots. All right, so the first thing I thought is, that's a bug. That's terrible. That's a down, you know, a real downside of the iodine technique. But is it a bug, you know, or is it a, you know, is it actually a positive thing? So again, if there's no spots on the star, there's no difference in our radial velocities. It's not an instrumental effect that we're seeing. So what it means is that the iodine technique is more sensitive uh, than the CCF technique to variability in the surface of the star. I think that's really important because we've struggled for years to try and understand, you know, high-res data doesn't seem to be quite as good as the HARPS data, you know, what's going on. Um, and I think that this is actually a big hint that photospheric velocities, uh, we have some hope of actually pulling that information out if we're a little clever. Okay, so today, here's the situation today. It's the same situation that we've had for 20 years, 20 plus years now, right? We take a spectrum and we derive a radial velocity measurement from that spectrum. And then I say, damn, some fraction of that radial velocity that I just measured came from the surface of the star. It's not an orbital velocity. So what am I going to do about it? I, I know, I'll try and find something that correlates with variability, like spots. It might be a line bisector variation. It might be the full width half max of the CCF. You know, it might be a correlation with emission in the core of the H alpha lines uh, or the calcium 2 H and K lines. Or maybe I can do photometric monitoring and I can find something that correlates there. Maybe I can use Gaussian regression uh, processes. Um, but all of these approaches operate on a single number, right, that's been pulled out of the spectrum, the radial velocity. All right, and each of these techniques may be more or less sensitive to particular types of stellar jitter. But in any case, our attempts to decorrelate the photospheric velocities can only be approximately correct. They can never be exactly correct. So we've been stepping back from that approach. Uh, here's a plot that Jeff Valenti made. It shows the uh, solar spectrum and then in, uh, in black, and then in red is a difference between the solar spectrum at high and at low activity periods. And what you can see is that line by line, the uh, atomic absorption features are responding differently to changes in the magnetic field strength, right? Uh, and in some sense, for slowly rotating stars, you're not going to see a big change in the line profile because the line broadening is, you know, all from um, thermal broadening on the surface of the star. It's not from rotational broadening, from, ro rota from slowly rotating stars. So all you're going to the only effect you're going to see is that some uh, lines get a little shallower than others. You're, all the information is going to vary there. And I think in the, for the CCF, there's not such a huge penalty. Yeah. Two more questions. Yeah. Studies, this integrated cement spectrometer. Do we have all the visible, or I think we have just small windows like this? Yeah, just small windows. Small. Yeah, exactly. So we're we're just trying to find out, you know. Um, do, is there motivation for looking sort of line by line? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the stellar noise for inactive stars, so those are the stars we like, chromospherically inactive stars, may not show up in line bisectors. For slowly rotating stars, there'll just be slight variability in the line depth of spot sensitive uh, lines. And I had a graduate student who worked for a few years trying to see if we could pull things out that way, and it turned out to be not so trivial. So one more time, I go back to Xavier, I say, can we try and test this? Uh, and, uh, and my student, uh, Alan uh, Davis, did all the work. Uh, and so, and with Jesse Sajewski uh, actually guiding us. Um, and so this time, we want to see if we can identify and distinguish the stellar variability um, on a pixel-to-pixel -pixel basis. Radial velocities are unique. Unlike transit photometry, we have 400,000 pixels to work with. We just squished it all into one number and then said, now what do we do? Let's go back to those 400,000 pixels, right? 
So that's what we've done. And if, let's see. And if you look at uh, Alan's uh, poster and ask him to explain it to you, um, then the technique that we started with is principal component analysis uh, to look for variability, right, uh, on the sort of pixel by pixel base basis. And what we found is that the information, the variability, uh, looks different. The, the PCA scores look different for things like spots and plage versus planets. Okay, so that is, we got our first, you know, I feel like I'm climbing this wall. So we found our first toe hole. We just kicked, a, kicked our foot in there, and we're clinging onto the edge of the cliff now. All right, uh, but again, uh, hanging onto this idea of instead of using one number, the extracted radial velocity, let's look at all variability in the 400,000 pixels that we have in the spectra. Okay, so why didn't we ever do this before? You know, why, what, what does that mean? What should we do? We just did a simulation, but that simulation operated on a spectra that had a resolution of 500,000, right? It was an FTS spectrum. And it had a signal to noise of 1,000. How many, how many spectrographs do we have in operation like that that are doing Doppler surveys? Anybody? Zero? <laughs> Zero is the right answer. OK, so uh, why not go to high resolution, right? So the, here's why not. So um, this figure, uh, that was, which was put together by my uh, graduate student, Jack Moriarty, um, but other people have done this as well. John Johnson and uh, his uh, students have looked at this. Other people have looked at this. Um, we tried to characterize, just with a cross-correlation, what kind of radial velocity precision we could get all right, as a function of signal-to-noise. And we varied the resolution uh, in the convolution kernel uh, of the simulated data. And what you see is that you know, going from a resolution of 40,000 to a resolution of you know, maybe 100,000, you, you gained quite a bit. You gained uh, you know, 20 centimeters per second at the very highest signal-to-noise uh, regime. But as you go higher from 100,000, let's say, to 200,000, eh, are we ever going to be able to pull out a few centimeters per second difference? You know, probably not. And so why would you go to high resolution? It's expensive. You're taking the light and you're spreading it out over many pixels. Um, and that costs observing time. So we never really, you know, that, this is what, these are the plots that we made to decide what should the resolution of my spectrograph be. All right? And these plots misguided us for years. So, um, so then we pushed on this idea a little bit harder, a PCA analysis. And had <clears throat> um, Alan then took the uh, spectra that Xavier uh, created with SOAP2, and he changed the resolution of the spectra, right? And he changed the signal to noise. So here's where the FTS Solar Atlas sits at high, really high uh, spectral resolution and really high signal to noise. And here's where we work with uh, Keck and Lick Observatory, right? We're in this box right here. And so now if you ask, how many principal components can you extract? when you're down here in this box? The answer is one. All right, you have binned down, you have pixelated the information in your spectra so that you can pull out one variability in one dimension, right? You can't really distinguish variability in other dimensions. So, you know, sitting at Lick Observatory, if I were working at a resolution of 50,000, signal to noise of 100, I could have built harps, right? We could have built harps, and we actually wouldn't have done any better. That's what I, that's what I conclude from this uh, plot, because the information has been lost. All right, so now, uh, let's see, what was I gonna say? <laughs> All right, so if you're working in this little box here, the only thing you can do is try and chisel away the photospheric components using line bisector variations, which are still aren't very sensitive because you haven't oversampled the line, you know, or other activity indicators like emission on, in calcium H and K. And how well does it work? Well, we've been doing this for 25 years. It doesn't work very well, okay? It works great down to about a meter per second. If we want to push beyond a meter per second, we've got to move out of this box and we've got to move up t in that direction, all right? So um, at higher resolution, uh, there's a trade-off between, you could also say, oh, yeah, but look, if I want to get, let's say I'm never going to get in this really dark purple box up here because that extremely high resolution and extremely high signal to noise means that there are basically three stars in the sky that you can observe and get, you know, match those two conditions. Um, but so, so I'll go for the next best thing, 
and I'll try and work in here. And I'll build my, res my spectrograph so it has a resolution of, I don't know, 70,000. But I'll just try and get a signal to noise of, you know, 600 or 700. Okay, so was that the smart choice? Is that the right choice, right? Well, um, if you increase the resolution, then there's a linear increase in the exposure time that you need as you, with resolution. If you're trying to go to higher signal to noise, it goes as exposure time squared. So if you're just looking to run the most efficient campaign possible, because you need, also need very high cadence data, then I think high resolution is actually a, not a bad choice. And it's something that we overlook for a long time. So here's some of the spectrographs um, that you know, we are working here with Lick and with Keck. Uh, and so our team is, has built Express with a, a resolution of 150,000. And Harps and, and Newid are, have similar, similar resolutions and with high signal to noise. Um, well, we'll see. Because we'll see what happens with all these instruments. Because all I've shown you is something about the information content of the spectra. I haven't shown you a path forward to actually distinguishing the effects of stellar activity and radial velocity measurements. And that's because we don't know that answer yet. We're working really hard on that. OK, so the great thing is that we're lucky to be able to work with, um, you know, I, I think we have a, this dream team uh, between Jesse and, and, and Eric and Xavier and Jeff Valente. Um, and in particular, as a statistician, Jesse brings a lot of ideas that we just couldn't imagine because we, we don't understand the literature, right? And some of the techniques are things like sparse functional regression, um, which are used to, if you have a stack of images, and the images are all have something wrong with them. One is blurred, one is skewed, one is off in color, right? Then you can look sort of uh, pixel by pixel at the variability uh, across the stack of images. And you can with, you can that weight that, this is my kindergarten version, and you should correct me. <laughs> you can sort of reconstruct an image, right, based on that knowledge. And you can recover uh, from an original image, which looks like this, that has been degraded. You know, um, some of these techniques are pretty good at recovering a cleaner image. So I think in just very broad strokes, the idea is that if we can recover the clean spectrum, the activity clean spectrum, um, then we can do the Doppler analysis there. And then the other atoms that are left behind, which might be spots or faculae or plage or meridional flows, are astrophysics. And maybe we can do something with those as well. Um, so I'll just end with a few thoughts um, that if we can separate out stellar jitter in the radial velocity technique, we have a hope of improving the precision. And I think, too, certainly better than a half a meter per second. I don't know the answer, right? Even I might say in my NASA proposal, we're going to shoot for 10 centimeters per second, right? But I don't know for sure. But you know, that's the direction that we're pushing. Because if we don't improve the radial velocity precision, then uh, I think that the trajectory of exoplanets is going to be much flatter than if we do, right? We're going to have much less information than if we really push down and have a technique that's robust at measuring 10 centimeter per second uh, radial velocity measurements in, in real time in stars, right? That accounts for activity. Um, and I think that uh, this tells us that radial velocity measurements have an exciting opportunity um, to use this pixel by pixel variability in the hundreds of thousands of pixels in the spectrum. Uh, when we have use very high resolution spectra, okay, so resolutions may be greater than 100,000. Um, and that's uh, not really possible with transit photometry. You'll, we'll talk, you'll be talking about the statistical techniques to clean the, the transit photometry. But there, you know, it's a very, it's a completely different problem. You mostly have to work with that, with the single extracted time series uh, light curve. Uh, we have an opportunity to do something different. If the new successful, uh, statistical techniques are successful, then I think optical spectroscopy is going to be where it's at. All right? I think it's going to have an advantage over the infrared. The line density is higher. We don't have problems with telluric contamination, which you have from the ground. Uh, so I, I, you know, and, and it's, um, yeah, I, I think we're going to do uh, well. The detectors are more stable. There's a whole lot of reasons, mostly because we've been pushing on the technology uh, in optical spectroscopy. 
why I think that this is still a good place to work. Um, I, the perfect thing would be, as Chaz and I have said, the dream machine is to have a spectrograph, uh, maybe like Carmenis, right, which has an optical arm and an infrared arm and does the very be highest precision that it can uh, at all of those uh, wavelengths. So uh, my, my feeling is that the techniques that work on radial velocities right now are limited, right? The line bisector variations, the full width half max, all those things are keeping us stuck at about a meter per second. Maybe we can push it down by a factor of two with things like Gaussian regression. But I don't think we're going to really, uh, in a convincing way, get down to, to centimeters, 10 centimeters per second with those, um, with those techniques that operate on a single number, the radial velocity. Uh, and then it opens up a whole new area, right? We've all wanted to look at young stars for some time, but they're, fo they're chromospherically incredibly active. And paradoxically, you know, the, the biggest signals are the easiest ones to detect and to correct. And so it gives us a chance to go back to those young stars. Like, you know, I can't wait to look at TW Hydra again uh, with an optical spectrometer and with these techniques to see if we can also recover a uh, radial velocity curve and with optical spectroscopy that looks as nice and as flat as the CryRes uh, spectra. Okay, so I think that is... My last slide, in case anyone has questions, I'm happy to take them. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, yeah, so the question is, why not, uh, why not go back to fundamental physics, right? We understand spectroscopy pretty well, and why not, you know, figure out how lines are affected by spots and meridional flows and faculae and, and so on. And um, I, I think that is a parallel effort. I just, I'm not convinced because I think that the spots are not, you know, isolated on the ascending edge of the star. They're, they're kind of all over, like a belt around the equator of the star. Um, and they're combined with other noise sources. So I think we'll get variability from multiple uh, uh, effects. And, I'm, and that might be, that will be an order of magnitude harder to pull out than just to, to say, oh, there's variability here um, that, that doesn't look like a Doppler shift. That's my gut feeling. So right now, that, that's, yeah. Um, people are, I mean, there are definitely people who are, uh, Xavier, in fact, is, is someone who's working on understanding, um, combining, well, all, uh, the, with, with Harps North, this looking at the solar spectrum and then combining the incredible information that we have from the spacecraft around the sun, which give us like incredible information. So yeah, there are, there are a few groups who are trying to work on that and see what we can back out. Um, yeah. Right, okay, so hopefully I don't have to repeat all of that. <laughs> but but, but I, I think Eric is, is arguing that if we have enough radial velocity data, that there could still be ways of of pull, statistical ways of extracting, pulling, pulling apart, pulling apart, uh, distinguishing the photospheric velocities from the orbital velocities. Using really standard methods. Yeah. And the problem is, um, you know, so as we push up, I mean, I think we're still throwing away information at that point. We have real information in those 400,000 pixels. And, and I don't want to comment on the rest of your talk. Yeah. There's many other things, and there's sparsity, there's other things. Yeah. I don't want to say that. I don't want to say anything negative. I only yeah. want to say something. <laughs> oh, I, I hoped it was positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that we, we should all come at this from as many different ways as we yeah. can. There no, definitely no, is no one path. Um, I'm, my, my gut feeling is that if we can clean up the spectra first, we need many fewer points to be able to measure the Doppler shifts. So we, you know, um, and I'm uh, also a co-chair on the Louvoir study, which is the idea, let's build a 16 meter telescope, park it at L2, it lasts for a century, right? Um, it's serviceable by astronauts so we can upgrade, it only takes two weeks to get out there, so we can upgrade the instruments now and again, right, over the next uh, 100 years. And, um, and so, you know, uh, once, you, once you have that kind of an instrument in space, um, then you can get in this corner, actually, with a high resolution spectrograph on the back end of that telescope. Uh, and, um, and you have no telluric contamination. And there's all sorts of exciting reasons, I think, for you know, thinking about that possibility, measuring the masses of the planets at the same time that you get the uh, spectra from the atmospheres. But yeah, okay, so 
I, I definitely hope that you can push in this direction and improve the separation of signals. Yeah, hi. I have a question. Yeah. It's about the uh, experiment you did with the diagram. Yeah. Uh, you got different uh, RMS, and the question I have is, is there, a, I mean, if you're using the, the mass, right, the function, yep. what happens if we increase the yep. That's a really good question. So I, I think you know I'm really excited to go back to this and and really try and uh, push this further and understand it. Not that I would ever use the iodine technique, you know, again going forward, but I still think there's there are lessons to be learned there uh, in our archival data. So that's an interesting idea. Just begin to. S in fact, you have code now, which yeah, will. The thing is, you can analyze the spectrum from half from any instrument. The yeah. same way they're do doing it with the iodine itself. That's right. Like modeling all the shape of the spectrum. Yeah. This you can do. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So I think it hasn't been done yet, but it's a really great suggestion. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Yep.